this sermon is entitled Hands. It was originally spoken in Johnstown, Pennsylvania on September 11th, 1955, and subsequently in Winbur, Pennsylvania, September 16th, 1956. It's entitled Hands, taken from the scripture Psalm 119, verse 109, that says, I hold my life in my hand continually. Do you remember the hands of Jesus? It was his hands that lifted little children to the attention of the world. With his hands, he blessed the food that fed the multitude. He stretched forth his hand to heal the leper. He used his hand to write in the sand words that frightened the guilty woman's accusers and that said to her, go and sin no more. On the cross, nails were driven through his hands. After the resurrection, he showed his hands to the disciples that they might believe. When the psalmist wrote, I hold my life in my hand continually, he could have meant that what you do with your hands determines the quality of your soul. Cicero said, the hand is a witness to our faith. Palmistry, which has little scientific basis, tries to make people believe that their lives are determined by the lines of the hands. And in a sense, this is true, but only as you and I make it so. An old legend says that once three young ladies disputed among themselves as to whose hands were the most beautiful. One dipped her hands into a pure stream of water. Another tinted her fingers with the pink of wild berries. And the third gathered flowers whose fragrance clung to her fingers. A haggard old woman passed by and asked for some gift, but all refused her. And then a fourth young woman, with no claim to beauty of hands, satisfied the beggar's need. The old woman said, It is not the hand that was washed in the brook, nor the hand tinted with red, nor the hand garlanded and perfumed with flowers that is the most beautiful, but the hand that gives to the poor. As she spoke, her wrinkles disappeared. Her staff was discarded, and she stood as an angel from heaven. Of course, this is only a legend, but its judgment is true. The most beautiful hands are those that minister in Christ's name to others. Ray Shaw, a famous sculptor, said, Whenever your hands are beautiful does not depend on tapering fingers or smooth skin. It depends on what is in your heart and what your soul and mind make your hands do. Certainly we have the power to make our hands hands of guilt or hands of goodness. Jesus said of Judas, The hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. There they are at the table, the hands of goodness and the hands of guilt. The first Bible reference to hands stained with blood is that to the hands of Cain. Any individual who takes the blood of another is cursed by God's world. True, there can be forgiveness, but though the wound heals, the scar remains. The most understanding example in literature is that in Shakespeare's Macbeth. You remember how when the blood guilt was upon the hands of Lady Macbeth, she went to the bowl to wash off the blood. Though her hands were washed, you hear her cry, Out, cursed spot, out! Even the very earth rises up to cast her from its presence. Carl Sandburg, in his Life of Lincoln, described the death of John Wilkes Booth. Some have advanced the idea that Booth killed Lincoln because of a perverted sense of patriotism, but Sandburg contends that he did so because of jealousy. Booth was America's foremost actor, and he felt Lincoln was depriving him of first place in the hearts of his fellow Americans. He wanted to be an idol, an American idol, and so a peculiar psychological prepossession seized him. He would destroy this rival and elevate himself. It was written of Booth that he had the presence of God and the voice of a singer, but that his hands were his greatest asset for they held his audiences spellbound by the beauty of their movements. In a museum in Washington, there hangs the pistol with which these hands sent the bullet into the brain of America's great statesman. Then Booth hid in a barn where he was smoked out and shot, and as he lay dying, he asked the doctor to raise his hands that he might see them. <laughs> useless, he said, useless. And then death took him. Booth's hands became useless the moment they yielded to a wrong thought. I wonder today if someone is out there who may be 
thinking of doing wrong? Perhaps he or she is trying to rationalize it into decency. I beg of you to fold your hands in prayer and ask God's help. In Rodin's painting, The Hand of God, we find God holding the world in his hand and molding it to make mankind, squeezing the clay into its most beautiful form. When God wanted to come to earth in perfect form, he chose the form of a man, and he gave his creature hands with which to clasp other hands with other men and with God. Hands have built the cathedrals of worship, of commerce, and education. Hands have pictured the sunrise and sunset. They have painted portraits of God, writing his name in sparkling letters across the midnight sky. They have written words of inspiration and comfort. And they have guided the transportation of the world across the land and sea and the air. And they have cared for the aged and the infirm. Hands have directed the lives of little children so that when we recall the hands of our mothers, we can say with Bishop McCabe, I almost weep when looking back to childhood's distant day. I think how those hands rested not when mine were at their play. I have looked on hands whose form and hue a sculpture's dream might be, yet are those aged wrinkled hands most beautiful to me. The Scottish evangelist John McNeil used to tell how, as a lad, he worked at an out-of-the-way railroad station. On Saturday night, he would walk home to spend Sunday with his parents. It was always late when he finished work, and the road was long and lonely, and he needed all the courage he could muster for the journey. One night, darker than usual, found him particularly nervous. Suddenly, he heard a footstep, and his heart seemed to spring into his throat. And then someone called, Is that you, John? And he recognized his father's voice. Knowing the lad might have been frightened on such a night, his father had come to meet him. And I just slipped my hand into his, the great preacher said. And I was no longer afraid of anything. Recently, I saw a picture of two great hands clasped over a large city. One hand is labeled management and the other labor. Underneath are these words, the need of the hour. Well, this is the need of the hour, how we need to join hands in friendship around the world. So frequently we forget that there is only one race and that it's the human race. Albrecht Dürer, a very famous Hungarian painter, painted a great devotional masterpiece called Praying Hands, portraying with tremendous effectiveness the appeal of hands in supplication. Well, the story is that Drewer and his brother wanted to become painters, but when lack of funds made it impossible for both of them to go with the necessary training, it was decided that Drewer should be the first to study. <clears throat> By the time Drewer had completed his training, the hands of his brother had become so hard and calloused by toil in the gold mines that they had lost their delicate touch and could not handle the brush. Then it was that Drewer made the painting of these hands, which immortalized his brother's spirit of sacrifice and devotion. Now, some of you remember the story of Judson's life. He was the great Christian missionary to Burma. After he had been in prison, lying in stocks for months, he finally gained his freedom and asked the king of Burma for permission to go to a certain city to preach the gospel. Said the king, I am willing for a dozen preachers to go to that city, but not you, not with those hands. My people are not fools enough to listen to and follow your words, but they will not be able to resist those scarred hands. When an old guide in the Alps saw a man trembling on the edge of a great crevice, he reached down a strong, reassuring hand. Here, he said, take this hand. It has never yet lost a man. To the person of faith, Battling against fearful odds, God reaches down his hand at the heart of a cyclone tearing through the sky and flinging the clouds in the towers by is a place of eternal calm. So here in the roar of mortal things, I have a place where my spirit sings in the hollow of God's palm. Many times children sleeping in their small beds near their parents will reach out in the darkness and ask mother or daddy, hold my hand. Just so, we who are children of God have faced the darkness of the night and have been afraid. We have cried out, Father, hold my hand. And in his infinite love, he has taken hold of our hand 
and led us into the morning. M. Louise Haskins said it the best. Go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. For that shall be to you better than light and safer than a known way. So take God's hand and let him lead you in the way everlasting. Amen. to the wonderful world of faith, one of seven worlds in Seven World Productions, a division of Angel Grand Music. This world is dedicated to inspiring the viewer with episodes about the role of faith in our lives. My name is Gino, owner of Angel Grand Music and executive director of Seven World Productions, and I will be narrating stories of defining moments in our lives, including sermons written by my father over 50 years ago that are still appropriate for our age. We'll also discuss the common denominators of all religions. Together we're going to discover the power of faith to enhance our living experience. Now be sure to click like and leave your comments and go ahead and subscribe to receive email notifications of updates in new episodes. Also check out our other worlds in, in the wonderful world of art, the world of books, the world of family, the world of food, the world of games, and the world of music. Go and be inspired.